Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the conference. Without any further ado, I invite on stage Professor Nuno Fernandes, the Dean of the School. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Catolica. How are you? Very good. So it's a pleasure to see you here for another Knowledge at Catolica. So we started this Knowledge at Catolica series of conferences earlier in this year, uh, basically to showcase the, the great things that at Catolica we do with the society and with our partners outside. Uh, and we've been doing this in several themes related to the expertise of our faculty. In this case, Today is the, the honor of having uh, the, the program led by Professor Celine Abecasis Moedas, who, who is a strategy and entrepreneurship professor. She's also the director of our Center for Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship. And together with our partners at Startup Lisboa, developed this great program that you have today with us on the future of retail and fashion. So without further ado, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I hope you enjoy this, this evening. Okay, thank you. And now, this is my pleasure to invite Professor Selene Abacassis Modas. She is the founder and academic director of the Center for Technological Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you here at uh, Catolica. Um, it is also my great pleasure to work on this topic. It's a topic that I've been working on for the past 15 years. So um, I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, the first thing that I want to discuss with you is that um, it seems, for a lot of people, it seems that technology and fashion is a new phenomenon. I want to prove you the contrary. If you think about it, this machine, which is called the Jacquard weaving machine, which was uh, created in, in 1801, so at the beginning of the 19th century, is considered as the first computer. Okay. So if you think about it, the textile and, and clothing industry and the world of fashion gave to the world the first computer. This is not the usual way to present it, but you know, this was the first machine that was working with cards. It's a computer. Um, there's a lot of other technologies that you know, uh, were uh, used in textile and, and fashion across time. Another one that I think everybody is familiar with is the fast fashion model. The fast fashion model, Zara, for most, you know, that most of us has visited at least once in our life, most of us even more than that, um, is the perfect example of how you can use technology to trace your sales and therefore to replenish fast and therefore to avoid the terrible phenomenon of sales at the end of the season. And finally, uh, maybe a technology that is less visible to the B2C world, which is the computer-aided design. So computer-aided design is a technology, is a software through which designers design clothes, not like you see it in movies in a very romantic way with a pen and a, and a piece of paper, but you know, through technology. What is the future? So the future is made of a lot of technologies, and you know, these are just a few, and, and, and my colleagues here are going to present you even more. So first, you know, in, in the world of manufacturing, 3D printing and digital printing, so you know, today we can and we do digitally print fabrics. We can 3D print shoes. We can 3D print dresses. They are not very comfortable, but we can do it. Um, we also have to uh, take into account that the number one player in retail, which is Amazon, has now become the number one player in clothing. Actually, if you realize, I have chosen the term very carefully. I didn't say fashion. I said clothing. But I know we'll come back to that. So Amazon, in terms of volume of sale, is the number one player in clothing. So it sells more than the traditional players. And this started about two years ago. There are a lot of new players that are Farfetch, and Farfetch is going, is going to be represented here. And as you will see, there are a lot of other new players that have emerged with those new technologies. Finally, I want to raise two new phenomena, the phenomenon of influencers, bloggers, you know, which is the something that is familiar to the young generation here, maybe less to my generation. Um, there's a case that I use in my class of the blonde salad, which is the blogger, an Italian blogger called Chiara Ferragni. Uh, she started her blog, she was not even 30. Today, last time I checked, uh, she had a team of 15 people and she had revenues of more than 15 million. 
And this is last time I checked, which was about two years ago. So, you know, this is probably even more today. And she has huge power. And today, the influencers are substituting the magazines, the fashion magazines like Vogue. Finally, wearables is also a big trend, and we'll have uh, more information about that today, and how technology can be embedded into clothing, and, and you know, this is a, an, an, an infinite source of, um, of data. So what about uh, retail? As you know, the world of retail is going through what some are calling the retail apocalypse. You know, stores are closing, traditional stores are closing. At the same time, what we see is that the stores that will be able to reinvent themselves to make the integration between online and offline more, um, um, you know, more seamless will be the ones that are going to survive. Um, Amazon Go, which is the cashier-less store, is making cashiers obsolete. Let's see what, uh, what is the future with that. And then what we find is that digital players like Farfetch and others are also investing in traditional retail. So clearly the two worlds are, are going to work together more and more. So it is now my pleasure to uh, present the panel to you. So they will, you know, they will present each other's uh, one by one. But let me say just a word. So the first one is Philippa Neto. So Philippa, I have to say, was my student a few years ago. We're not counting. So she's now, um, she's now working at Farfetch, and she's going to tell you more about, about that in a second. Joana Rafael uh, from Sensei is now the founder of a, a tech company. And she was also sitting right here uh, in an entrepreneurship program. Sabine is involved in wearables and has been involved in fashion and tech for a, lo a, a long time. Because she's not Portuguese, she's not a former student, but I'm sure we'll find a way to connect her to us. She's an entrepreneur in residence at uh, Startup Lisboa, so you're part of the family. And Nuno Ribeiro from Farber Novel is going to present us a very interesting study on, on Amazon and fashion. And are you an alumni? Are you an alumni of Catolica? Yeah. And, and, and it's an alumni of Catolica. Perfect. So without further ado, I'm going to call on uh, Philippa. What's because? Oh. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you for the invite. Um, as Celine was saying, uh, currently I'm at Farfetch. It's been now a year as a principal innovation specialist. Um, I would love to ask, first of all, how many of you have heard about farfetch.com? Okay, uh, all right, makes it easy for me. Uh, and so it will, next when I'll do the presentation, um, I'll share more about what we're building. Yeah, it's already on? Okay, great. So, what is Farfetch? Farfetch is a marketplace for luxury fashion. That's how we started, but now it goes way beyond that and we have now many more businesses. Um, we are very knowledgeable about tech, but we have a strong passion for the fashion and for the luxury industry. Um, we believe in empowering individuality and we want to be, our mission is to be the global platform for the luxury industry. So it all started in uh, 2007 when José Neves, our founder, was in Paris and understood that on one side e-commerce was booming, but at the same time small boutiques were struggling because they didn't have the financial capabilities or the technological know-how to compete with players like, let's say, Amazon or Net-A-Porte. Um, in the meantime, and in the last 10 years, because now Farfetch is already a 10-year-old uh, company, um, we made this transition from farfetch.com alone, where we just sell a luxury items to actually having many more businesses. We now sell, for example, technology to brands. For example, Manolo Blanik is one of the brands that we support. We make all of the websites white labeled for them. We support operations. Um, but basically the design, the experience is the brand that, that decides. This is one of our businesses. Then we have uh, what we call pool commerce, which is our fashion concierge business unit where basically everything, if you are a VIP and only if you are a VIP, you can access this service. So even items you wouldn't find on farfetch.com, you can basically have a stylist going around the world to find this item for you. Uh, we basically have also an offline experience because Farfetch also believes that uh, retail and luxury retail will not be online alone. 
So we use uh, Browns, we acquired Browns, which is a boutique that we use as a lab for a lot of retail technology we are testing and we have a partnership with uh, Chanel, for example. Um, and yes, this is in the store of the future uh, business where you are basically testing what will the store of the future be like and supporting brands um, with this. So we talked already about farfetch.com, the website. We talked about black and white. We talked about browns. We talked about uh, our private client um, service. And I would like to, you, to show you, this is a video about our store of the future business unit. A few numbers. After 10 years, Farfetch is about 3,000 people. Um, we have 13 offices globally. Um, more than 20 million visits per month on farfetch.com. Um, we have recently uh, IPO'd uh, very successfully. Um, and this is it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's also my pleasure to be here. I'm not an alumni, but I actually did an entrepreneurship course here with Professor Pierre Jean. It was uh, already exploring an idea that many years after, actually, we got a little bit back to it. And I'm going to present it to you now, uh, the company that we have been building for the last year, Sensei. Um, thank you so much, Celine, for this invitation. It's a, a very hot topic right now, the transformation of retail. Actually, uh, we, we are focusing also on uh, um, grocery retail and uh, consumer retail. So I will tell you a little bit uh, a story. I have not many slides, but I will uh, tell you about um, what we are trying to create here. So at Sensei, we want to preserve something that we believe is special, which is the store shopping experience. Because we believe that something that moves so many people every day to stores, it must have become a fundamental part of people's lives. I'm a co-founder of Sensei, which is a company that um, 
which is a company that brings vision to computers to automate many things at the retail store and to help retailers know everything that is happening at their physical stores. You know that 43% of all our buying decisions, they are made on the spot when we are shopping at stores. And they are triggered many times by our senses or by our memories or even our passions. And this is actually something which is really hard to replicate if we are on a smartphone or a computer. And I believe this is just one of the many reasons why 90% of all retail today still happens offline in real physical stores. But you know clearly, and we'll see it here today, retail is changing. And uh, digital retailers, they are growing fast and steady. And actually, they are leveraged by a strong knowledge about their customers and uh, like high efficiency, efficiency of having all their operations digitally connected. And as Celine was saying in the beginning, uh, today, retail stores are facing something that the media call retail apocalypse. Because even though retailers are very big enterprises with uh, revenues on the order of the billions, they have very uh, small net margins. Okay. They have very sm small net margins. They mean, this means that uh, um, the digital and the physical, they are suffering high transformations and retailers are very impacted by that. So. Digital retailers, as we all have seen, they are moving offline. And actually, we believe that the greatest opportunity in retail today is actually to merge the gap between what is digital and what is physical. And you know, and for this, we actually see it be being called digital. Oops. Okay. So at Sensei, we were wondering if we could do this and help retailers achieve this digital experience. And we were wondering if we really need to put sensors on all the products and if we really need to scan products when we are shopping. You know, and we were wondering if we could do this with no tags or no apps, just like seamlessly, with fluid sensing. And actually this was one of the reasons that made us create sensing. So we created computer vision algorithms that turn cameras, surveillance cameras, or any camera whatsoever into powerful sensors that can digitize what is happening in a retail store and help retailers digitize their stores overnight. And actually being able to browse for what is in a, in a shelf or in a store in real time, uh, anywhere in any store and know exactly the inventory that you have there. You know, because with uh, Sensei, we built something that allows to digitize more than 500 products in one shelf using just one sensor, which is a camera. And so it's possible to see how the product is displaced, if it actually is missing out of the shelf, or also, for example, measure um, the performance of a campaign or the interaction of customers with certain products in stores. And you know, when we mix the component of tar um, searching for products, digital, digitizing products in a store and digitizing customer interaction will create a truly se seamless sensing uh, autonomous store where you can just enter the store, grab the products that you like on the shelf and then just leave and then you get charged automatically. So you know, we believe that just like as humans that we learn by seeing, we are actually on a mission to teach computers how to see the world and to understanding to understand it using computer vision, which is um, an artificial intelligence component using vision, just as like a human, making the computer being able to understand and to see what is happening at a physical space, in this case at a physical retail store. And actually, we believe that this is cameras and computer vision are the perfect enabler for AI-powered retail. And with this, we can allow retailers to manage their physical stores as if they were digital. And actually, this is our motto, this is our mission. We are here actually to help, to help save the store shopping experience. And um, actually, I'm a retailer myself. And this is why I have so much passion for what we are doing as well at Sensei. And I would like to leave you with a quote that talks about uh, bits and atoms, which is merging technologies that interact directly with the physical world. Thank you.
Thanks. Hi, I'm Sabine Seymour, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of two um, topics. Uh, one is basically uh, Moondial, that is a company that I founded in 98. Uh, and that actually is focused primarily on wearable technologies and fashion tech. And then the new company that I founded uh, a couple of years back, and um, I'm a startup Lisboa company now, and um, that's called Super. So um, first of all, um, this is an uh, example of a work that I curated and I was featured at the Museum of Applied Arts for the work that I've been doing in the last 15 years in uh, fashion and technology. So that's uh, literally uh, as a researcher, as uh, an entrepreneur, and then also as a curator. Um, I wrote a couple of books. Uh, one is called Fashionable Technology and the other one is called Functional Aesthetics. Um, the third one actually is called Computational Fashion, uh, which is a compilation of uh, research and works that have actually been uh, developed um, over the course of two and a half years or three years when I chaired the Computational Fashion Program um, at IBEAM in New York City uh, that was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, I was also the inaugural professor of fashionable technology and led the fashionable technology uh, laboratory at Parsons School of Design. Those of you who are fashion designers, um, it's a pretty well-known fashion school. Um, but the works that uh, I've been um, uh, mostly, mostly teaching um, and researching was this, for example, was uh, uh, a work by uh, Fito Segrera, uh, How to Actually Taste Sunshine or how does UV light actually taste? So creating sensors that you can, that tickle your tongue, uh, so you understand uh, what it might be if uh, the sun is uh, a sensory element. Um, I was also a visiting researcher and led a project called computational cellulose. Uh, those of you who are com um, chemists or textile engineers, um, it's basically cellulose out of wood chips. Um, but how do we actually can change the molecular structure of the actual fiber itself so we can shoot uh, current through and make the actual sensing uh, textile a sensor or make the textile a sensor um, that either senses bodily signs. So I'm actually a body sensorist. So I'm primarily interested in sensors that have to do with the body, whether they are in the body, uh, like a uh, or whether they are on your skin, like a skin responses and so forth. So that's basically a project that we did at Alta University together also with uh, Cornell University's um, textile uh, nanotechnology uh, laboratory with uh, Professor Juan Hinostrosa. Um, I also curated uh, for a couple of years uh, and initiated the fashion lab at the Museum of Applied Arts. Um, this was a project called uh, Sonic Fabric um, that was all around, and the entire uh, show was all around fabric that actually was making, or clothing that was making sounds, and it actually had sound inputs. This case actually um, is, um, uh, a scarf, which called uh, orchestral scarf uh, by Bless, um, and it was engineered by Popka Lab, um, so that every single way to close the scarf would actually make a different soundscape, so you can create an individual soundscape with your garments. And uh, the 3D printed button you see on the top there, um, I can't really show it, but it's a 3D printed button, that's basically a speaker, so making sure that uh, the actual interface of the garment, every single uh, interface um, on your clothing actually has a technical aspect to it. Uh, this was a scientific skin, so again, I'm very interested in making sure that we're using the skin as a metaphor, so the skin, the skin sweats, the hair stand up, uh, you actually um, um, transpire um, water through your sweat, so literally using the skin as, an, as a metaphor, in this case, on the left-hand side, you see um, an installation by Bear Conductive uh, Ink, and it's basically an ink that is integrated into the actual tapestry itself. Again, this is a textile tapestry, um, and you can it's a soundscape, so you basically um, use it um, as an inductive element, as an inductive interface. And on the right-hand side is actually a fashion designer um, who is based in Italy. He's Austrian, however. And this is not plastic, what you see. This is actually pig skin. So this is treated pig skin and actually has a chemical um, substrate to it. Um, so 
this all this work and all my work over the last uh, 15 or so years um, were what I call a nexus between silicon and style. So literally using the actual technical interface one, but then incorporating that and uh, in, a, in a way into the actual fabric and into the fashion design that is completely invisible. So yes, the quote before was from Visor, so I completely agree with that. Um, so at Mundial, we did a lot of work with a lot of different brands. This was, for example, for North Face, where we created um, an iPhone application that at that time was already using um, the actual motion of the uh, of the iPhone as an interface. Um, this was for uh, hiking and snowboarding. Uh, this was a typical interface uh, that we were uh, that we we were doing with a fashion design label called Wendy and Jim, um, where we were using just conductive regular conductive ink um, and uh, that was basically changing through or thermochromics that um, or photochromics that were changing through um, the interface of the Sun UV light uh, again uh, but it's very important for me that the actual fashion design and the design itself can stand on its own uh, and the technology is just literally completely invisible again disappearing into the fabric into the actual interface and you don't really know its technology uh, this again here you see the technology so this is a prototype I just wanted to show you also what it is when we start developing so this is basically using shape memory alloys this is uh, using the actual um, different uh, types of um, uh, um, technologies we explore to change the actual fabric and the shape of the material so this becomes uh, a, a basically a a dress that actually completely changes the shape. Um, we also did a lot of work on using external factors like uh, is it cold inside? Do we actually want to change the actual structure? Put the sleeves up, put the sleeves down. So there are a lot of these type of explorations. Um, same with um, the interface itself. How can we actually create interfaces that are organic uh, and are actually display interfaces? This is work we did with Philips. Um, so we basically integrated LumaLife here in uh, this was actually a prototype, so this is not a, a, a commercial product at this point. Um, and this was also uh, another interface where we were using soft switches and the actual um, uh, pockets themselves. So again, completely making sure that we that the um, um, the actual technology disappears. So this is what I did before. This is what I do now. So this is super. Um, so basically with super what we do is we tokenize the body so we take biometric data from the body through all these different elements that I showed before wearables clothing whatever we can get our hands on at this point um, and we take biometric data vital signs that is heart rate motion temperature galvanic skin responses and so forth um, environmental data that is data that basically if you have a have a pollen count or um, uh, pollution levels and also genetic information and we contextualize that information uh, we then sell it to our stakeholders that are either brands in sports in nutrition in healthcare and so forth however in between we have a layer of blockchain so we anonymize the data so we never know who is actually generating the data so it's basically we are selling trends per se that's um, anonymized uh, data sets. However, we also have the ability um, to um, uh, distribute the actual data uh, by uh, from the actual user if the user applies to. So this is a project. This is um, just one of the different uh, um, wearables we actually have been doing with uh, Sunto. Uh, we have a collaboration with them. They do our sensors. Um, so again, if uh, there's a requirement from our customers or our clients to also um, disseminate uh, actual wearables in terms of fashion tech, uh, this is a project. Uh, this is a product. I also have it with me. So if anybody who wants to see it. Um, Mercedes did a video on that, so it's just, um, and then we did a, a prototype, uh, sorry, a pilot with Fila Sport uh, using the exact same model, um, and this was basically where we, you were running for 500 miles and you got a sneaker. So this is sort of the typical brand application, if you would talk about it uh, from um, a customer perspective, that is a sports brand or um, a clothing brand. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, um, please do so and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nuno, as you know already, uh, and uh, I'm from Faber-Novell. 
it's it's working. Yeah, now I think it's working. So I'm Nuno from Faber Novel. Uh, we are a consultancy in innovation. Uh, we help big companies to change the business model and to adapt to what we call the new economy and the digital transformation. So we have made we study lots of um, the, the a lot of the big companies, the big mounts that are changing the world and are the most innovative companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and we have made a, a study. Uh, about Amazon entering in the fashion uh, world. Uh, what I'll show you, it's a sneak peek of this study. It is more uh, extensive than what I'll show you today. Uh, so we call it the future of giant of fashion. To understand that, um, as Celine told uh, before, uh, Amazon already sells a lot in clothing, but it's not in fashion yet. Um, uh, mostly socks. That's what they sold, uh, and some underwear. Uh, but we should understand the DNA of uh, Amazon, and especially the founder, uh, Jeff Bezos, how they approach the business. So Jeff Bezos has one uh, quote that says that uh, at Amazon we like to think uh, uh, to work in five or seven years. Uh, we are willing to plant the seeds and let them grow. So what we can understand from Amazon is that they are planting the seeds for a long time in fashion. Uh, since 2006, uh, they have uh, created e-commerce websites. They have bought several companies like Zappos uh, in the shoes uh, uh, website that sells uh, shoes in the US and uh, East Dane, for example, in 2013. Uh, but only last year, Amazon decided to attack the fashion uh, uh, industry. So they launched the fashion, Amazon Fashion. Uh, it's launched uh, last year. I'll show you a small video. Uh, it's no sound. The sound. Can you put the sound of the video? So just the you just heard the last part, but you get the... I'll not make it back. Uh, so, uh, what's innovative on the, the Apple approaching to the fashion world is that they launched the fashion Amazon Fashion Prime wardrobe, and the approach to the consumer is completely different. So, the consumer subscribes the Amazon uh, Fashion Prime wardrobe and receives uh, the clothes they want to try it, uh, they uh, try it for seven days after they decide to buy it or not, or send it back to Amazon. If they don't send all, uh, uh, if they get all the, the clothes they have decided to try it, they get an, a, a discount of 20%. So it's a different approach to the client, uh, pushing them to try it with, without any compromise. They already have uh, been present at London Fashion Week uh, and uh, they created six um, uh, pieces of uh, uh, and designed by, by a famous designer uh, in fashion and uh, hired some influential uh, partners and top models to try the clothes. They are creating also temporary uh, pop-up stores uh, that change the products in uh, two days, uh, create workshops uh, about trends in the, in the fashion, uh, yoga classes, and live music. They also are, and we should never forget that, about not just Amazon, but Google, Apple, etc. All these companies are very data-driven. So the data is a new oil, as we say it at faber Novel. And uh, they are very uh, uh, focused on analyzing the data of the consumer. Usually, first they copy, like Amazon Basics, uh, that you will get some examples. Then they create and start to design new clothes, and then they will manufacture uh, clothes in real time. Um, and as they have the DNA of a technological company, not just retail and e-commerce, they are trying and exploring new, new ways uh, to innovate uh, with artificial intelligence. One example is Amazon uh, Echo Look. 
It's like uh, the Amazon Echo. Most of you probably already know them. Uh, it's uh, but uh, it's uh, um, it's um, a device that makes photos and videos and recommendation for the for the client. Let me show you the video. Alexa, is it gonna rain tonight? Alexa, what's on my calendar? Alexa, turn the lights off. Okay. Alexa helps with thousands of things, and now she can help you look your best. Alexa, take a photo. Introducing Echo Look, a first-of-its-kind Echo with a hands-free camera. Echo Look takes photos using just your voice. Its built-in lighting and depth-sensing camera lets you blur the backgrounds to make sure your outfits pop, giving you clean, full-length photos that are easy to share with friends. Plus, get a live view or take videos to see yourself from every angle. Alexa, take a video. We've also created an easy way to get a second opinion. Introducing Style Check. It combines the best in machine learning with advice from fashion specialists. Just pick two outfits and Style Check will give you a recommendation based on current trends and what flatters you. Alexa can also help you create a personal lookbook it shows you what you wore and when, so you can keep track of your favorites and take your closet with you, wherever you go. Alexa, what's my commute? The fastest route takes about 15 minutes. Plus, Alexa is built in the cloud and always getting smarter, and so will Echo Look. Echo Look. Love your look every day. Another product that Amazon launched was uh, Amazon Echo View. It's like Amazon Echo, but with a, <coughs> with a screen. And when we call, talk about clothing and fashion, especially visual is very important. So that's why they created the, the Amazon Echo View. Another uh, change with uh, uh, artificial intelligence is that they created and are testing new algorithms, algorithms to design clothes with artificial intelligence so the computer and the software will create clothes very soon at amazon and after they will manufacture that so that's just a sneak peek of our study thank you very much thank you thank you all for your amazing presentation so um I, I don't know if we still have energy now after all of that. It's almost overwhelming. The future is going to be so different. So the question that I have for each one of you, and, and you can decide in which order you answer, is what do you see as the technology that is going to have the most impact in this world? But I don't know who wants to start. Maybe you can have one mic microphone on each side. Yeah. Philippa. So I, I think for... With the, my far-fetched eyes, it's quite difficult for us at this stage to say there's one technology that we think is going to um, just disrupt the, the industry. There are many uh, technologies we're looking at. Of course, everything related with artificial intelligence, blockchain technology. Um, but in e-commerce, we have something so simple as size and fit that hasn't been solved, right? So there's some things are still basic that may impact the unit economics of, of the retail and online retail in particular. So um, at Farfetch, we, we are focusing in, in four areas, how to enhance the e-commerce experience and through personalization, inspiration, size and fit tools. Uh, we are looking at retail technology because as Joanna said, we also believe that there is a lot of potential um, in the offline space to bring technology and we believe we are particularly well positioned um, at Farfetch to, to be one of the players to tackle and to help brands um, in that space. Um, so these are some of, of the areas um, but I wouldn't say there's just one concrete um, area. Of course in luxury authentication plays a, a very strong part mm -hmm. so for people that are uh, in the blockchain space, they would say this is um, the area, but I would say on, in terms of Farfetch, there's many areas we're looking at. Thank you. Joanna, what is your perspective? Which technology do you see having the most impact? So I have to agree with Philippe. I think the future technology is still yet 
to come. But for us at Sensei, we believe that uh, computer vision is a very powerful tool because it actually allows you to uh, identify yourself when you arrive somewhere without the need of a mobile even. And this can disrupt from the way you shop to the way you do payments. So for us, at least, this is uh, one of the most disruptive and powerful um, technologies, a component of artificial, artificial intelligence, the vision. Uh, and actually, because the vision is also something which is one of the most powerful tools that we humans have. So we believe that uh, artificial intelligence is, uh, so this is also something that can disrupt many industries. In this case, for retail, we believe that it can really turn us into users and not just customers when we enter a supermarket or a, or a retail store. So we start, when we enter, we become as if we would enter far-fetched e-commerce. We are already authenticated as a user. The retailer knows who we, who we are and uh, it can charge us in the end when we leave the store. Thank you. Well, I, I also do believe there are many, many different technologies and technologies are necessarily just a tool. So I think we need to be extremely careful about identifying, oh, AI, oh, blockchain, oh, you know, whatever it might be, um, because technologies are changing. Um, however, um, I think what is extremely important is to understand the human behavior, social context, and through that actually identifying, you know, which technologies we want to use. So yes, blockchain, anonymity, for us, it's of course, we want to anonymize the data, uh, or authenticate, or et cetera, et cetera. For AI, I mean, there are many, many instances. And artificial intelligence is sort of a tricky one because what we define as AI right now is not really AI. Uh, it's sort of like the baby steps. We're like li literally crawling on the floor right now. Um, but I think um, also in the context of that, it's about machine learning and actually how we um, understand the, the relationship between uh, the actual AI, quote unquote, and the and the machines themselves. Uh, so there are lots of different layers. I mean, of course, if I speak about super, it's of course blockchain to anonymize. It's of course the body. It's of course health data. It's of course about really thinking about you know how do we create a human perception around a healthy lifestyle. So uh, that actually enables uh, again using sports, using artificial intelligence in the context of health and so forth. Uh, in the background, having you know IoT devices talk to themselves, like each other, without having us to interfere. So, again, it is is a wide uh, range of different things where we have to create a matrix, basically, and really humanize technology, and not say technology is the means, but the human is is the centerpiece. Thank you, Nunu. Well, I think it's almost uh, anonymous that we agree with in artificial intelligence. I think it will change not just fashion and retail, but all the industries. So we are at baby steps at uh, artificial intelligence, but I think it will be a very impactful technology that will change lots of industries and most of the relationship between us humans and the machines. So they will begin to be human and create emotions in people and uh, it will be a great change on, on everything. Okay, thank you. Um, in a way, I think, you know, what people want to know is how it's going to be the retail and the fashion of, of the future. So who do you see, so who and how do you see the future? So who do you see maybe the new players? So there's a few new players that we have talked about already, but who are the other new players that you think are going to become very important in this, in this area? Uh, not only in terms of, of technology, but also maybe new businesses. Because mm -hmm. there's a part which is, what technologies we are after, uh, but in this space, and Amazon has done it quite well, um, we are also looking at new business models, right? What we have today from Amazon is they are one of the biggest, if not the biggest players selling um, servers, right? Server space, but it was a, a bookshop, right? So <laughs> it's the part of innovation and it also comes from the business models and what's there to come. Um, at Farfetch we had recently, uh, we just finished the first batch of our accelerator program, um, Dream Assembly, and one of the companies, for example, 
that we supported um, is an Israeli company. Um, they also are in San Francisco. And what they do is they have on-demand personal stylists. And this comes very in line with the part of the machines and the human. So what do they do? They basically have a marketplace of 500, a pool of 500 stylists um, that retailers can at any time um, use or as as consumers. So we, I can just go to, to the App Store and download Wishy and have a stylist and pay. Or I can go to a retailer and probably they will offer me for free if I spend up uh, above a certain value. So one of the things I see uh, is um, why would I shop in one place if I could have like a stylist on demand that can pull out a look for me and it would be for free, right? Um, there's other uh, businesses within the, the retail space that we, we think are interesting. Um, circular economy in particular in our last earnings calls, um, our, our founder mentioned that circular economy is one of the interesting spaces for Farfetch. We are seeing the same way we, we saw high fashion combined uh, with fast fashion. We are seeing now people going buying secondhand um, in platforms like Vestiaire Collective or The Real Real um, and mixing it with new items. So and uh, maybe selling back their old items to buy new items. Uh, and for example, in the US, there's one player alone that already makes 700 million in GMV. So one player alone uh, makes already uh, quite substantial and interesting uh, revenue. So we talked about before how Farfetch sees, for example, pool commerce, which is pretty much conversational commerce is, I saw Beyonce yesterday wearing this and I want it, can you get it tomorrow, right? It's very on demand, like the customer is demanding more and more. Uh, we saw Walmart, for example, investing in, in a, a company called uh, Black Jet, again, conversational commerce. The target there is mothers that don't have time and they want to do shopping by texting as well. Um, so these are some of, of the ways uh, that we, we think are interesting never forgetting that the luxury customer is a good mix. It can never be fully AI for us. We don't believe in that. Uh, we believe it's very interesting companies like Wishy that use an algorithm to match us with the perfect stylist. So I will get a stylist that has a similar style to me, but then it unlocks a human experience with everything that is conversational. It's, it's a human talking with me. It's, it's not a machine. I'm actually getting a real stylist. Um, so in luxury, we believe that AI can go up to uh, part of the experience, but we don't believe AI will take all of the experience because for us, that wouldn't mean luxury. So, Thank you, Philippa. I just want to build on that. Um, last week or two weeks ago, I was teaching to some of the people who are here in the luxury program, uh, the Vestiaire Collective case. And what we discussed is that a lot of the people who buy on, on Vestiaire Collective actually sell on it as well. So it's, a, it's, the same, it's the same people that buy and sell on, on Vestiaire Collective. And I also want to add the, the model of Stitch Fix that we, you know, that we have not uh, discussed yet. But Stitch Fix is particularly good at having the, the algorithm and the, the real and the physical, the real people designer. So they have, they, they have a great combination of not just technology, but human design as well. Yeah. Thank you. Joanna. So who do you see the players of tomorrow? in retail, in fashion, and potentially in technology? So I think the, the giant in the room is Amazon, for offshore, of course. So Amazon, they invested, for example, in e-commerce. They now they have about 50% of the market. And the next player after them, it's actually eBay, who has 6% of the market. So this is very normal to have a player that has such a, a potential. And actually, I think this was because they invested from 10 years ago, they were investing in automating everything in their supply chain. So now they are practically unbeatable. Nobody can beat Amazon. And actually, when you see them, uh, like a year ago, Amazon launched Amazon Go stores, so in Seattle, right next to their headquarters. And they created a totally unmanned store with no uh, cashiers in the store. So you just walk the store, you grab what you want, and you just leave. And actually, I think they set up a trend and a race where all retailers, like they look at this um, this move and they see, like, 
what is going to come next for us because actually when you have a store in a in a in a street a convenience store where you can just go buy your grocery after leaving the office and it has no queues and is open 24 hours and another one where you have to be in line like i think for all of us there is it's a no brainer so Actually, I think Amazon put the biggest pressure on the retail market, not only in e-commerce, but most recently in uh, physical retail. And actually, uh, I think they are here like opening their own physical stores. They just announced they are going to open 3,000 uh, physical stores all around the uh, United States and also in Europe in the next two years. So this is a real, real pressure on the market to adopt new technologies and to, to be more efficient. Thank you. So Amazon is, is, uh, is clearly one of the key players of the future. I think so. Also that Amazon will already is a player in this, in this field. But uh, I think there is plenty of space for new startups like the Cerro Collective that you, that you mentioned, for example. Farfetch is another example. So I think even the actual traditional fashion retailers can have a space on digital and transformation. Of course, they can work with Amazon or Vestir Collective or Farfetch or any other ones. So I think there is plenty of space for new players and newcomers and traditional ones to, to grow in this environment too. Sabine. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm like the alien here, right? Because I don't do retail, right? Um, so, um, Basically, I just want to give you, however, uh, the context of, of what is interesting for us is like, um, imagine now, uh, and I can't say names, but imagine now you do um, motorcycle clothing that has, that's connected. Uh, so that's basically the type of work that uh, we have been doing previously. And now how do you sell connected clothing or clothing that actually has a technical wearable component? And I showed in my presentation where technology is completely invisible, but how do you now sell that? So that is basically where we are coming in and where we have been uh, working with um, a few different brands as to like how to convey um, to do little digital pop-ups uh, that actually enable a consumer to actually experience what the connected or the um, smart apparel would actually do. Uh, so those are the things that, you know, we have been previously doing when it comes to fashion and retail um, or you know, really understanding how the space is actually working. However, what uh, Super is, is doing and what we have also been uh, very um, heavily involved is how to actually uh, behavioral analytics uh, involving the body uh, and again not talking about how somebody is moving around in a store but how somebody is actually wearing a certain item or how somebody is actually moving around uh, and where the sweat points on the actual body so those are the data sets that we are actually collecting and those are the data sets that are important for the actual production and the manufacturing um, and also the supply chain actually so where are the different components that need to go into a material or into a garment. Uh, so that's basically what we do at Super and what I've been previously doing. So again, um, I think it's very important um, also what you said before about, you know, Amazon is just one player and Amazon is making money with AWS. If they would have AWS, they wouldn't have the means to actually do all that other stuff. <laughs> so let's be clear about that too. Um, and, and so I think it is very important also to, to, to actually find uh, a company like that being, you know, um, in one hand, yes, a dominant player in many instances, but on the other hand also what they're really doing is, um, and, and I think that's where we really have to um, also make sure that new startups and so forth are really not scared but really like using that as a as an advantage they're using technologies that that we have been developing 20 years ago 10 years ago 15 years ago it's only they have the financial means to actually implement it um so that's also very very important to understand that um in the layer of of where what we are talking about is also where the financial uh, uh, power is and so that things like that can be implemented. Uh, 
getting on the, what Sabine is, is saying, that I think there is new challenges also for the manufacturers, because the cloth will be connected, and uh, there are there, the cloth will be will have operating system. Google, for example, is working. Uh, they have a project called Project Jacquard, and uh, with, they are working with Levis, so to create jackets that are connected and you can interact with the cloth. Uh, so it's also a new challenge for the manufacturers to work also with technology companies, startups, and also the, the big companies. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, you know, this, this all feels a bit like a science fiction. So I'm sure that what people want to know is, you know, how do you see the retail of the future? So can we, should we imagine a future with no store, no cashiers, no shopkeepers? How is it going to be? Is it, is it a future with no people? Is it a future with no stores? I think that question is for me, maybe. <laughs> you can start. Cashiers. So, yeah, so actually I think like since like industrial revolution has been replacing many uh, like tasks that humans do very automatically and actually being a cashier, it's actually a task that is quite um, like it actually creates quite problems in, re in retailers because nobody of a new generation wants to be a cashier anymore because this is a profession that has no, um, that has no creativity on it. There is no interaction with the customer uh, whatsoever on it. So actually, I think that stores that will not have a line will actually, put, uh, will actually free up these people to actually do what they should be doing in the store, which is helping customers to sell, to create new services. So. Actually, I think we will still be there in the stores, but we can actually uh, make our tasks in the store better using the computers to do what they do best and humans to do what we do best. Okay, so we'll, <laughs> there will still be people. Maybe no cashiers, yes. but still people. So what about stores? Will there still be stores? Philippa? Yeah, I think it, it's... It's very clear that Farfetch is, is betting on, on stores. <laughs> um, and when, our, when we look at the market, um, I don't know it by heart, but we're talking about around 80% um, of, the, of the luxury sales will still be offline. Um, what we see potential is offering and enabling uh, brands uh, to serve better uh, their customers. And you're giving the example of the sales assistant uh, we want to turn them into super sales assistants that um, it seems like they know everything by heart about what you, what you bought, what you like, what you saw online, what's in your wish list. You arrive to the store and everything is already kind of pre-populated in a way that you already have your wish list uh, in your changing room. This is one of the things we're working on. So stores will continue. Um, sales assistants will be there. We'll just be empowering them with um, with better tools, uh, making them more efficient and more creative and have a more creative job. No, no, maybe I, on, on, I really on the stores? Think that, yeah, sure, there will be stores. And we see this example from Amazon that is, sending, is coming from the digital to the physical. And we have lots of examples on, on that field. For example, Apple, uh, it's very, the, the stores, the physical stores are very important. Uh, so I think the, the experience can be improved with artificial intelligence, uh, no cashiers, uh, but sure there will be stores, physical stores. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, there will be experiences. So I think that is, that is uh, a word and, and uh, the combination between physical and virtual um, is just going to blur. Um, and um, I actually have this uh, metaphor that I use all the time. So we got we got uh, vinyl, and then we got uh, Spotify, right? So that's where we at. But now you know now it's 2018, and now mixtapes are coming back. So watch out, the eight is a back. Uh, <laughs> so I think then, and that is really where the experience is. So you you basically are using Spotify because you can share your music, you can download what you want, it's super simple, but it still only has a digital tone. Like if you are in music, you know, the tonalities are like this when you have a vinyl. So this is the physical store. It's the emotion, it's the cool shit, basically. 
And then you have the very pragmatic Spotify, you know, that's where you can share your data and your music and all over the world and whatever. And then once in a while you come into a store where like Supreme has those drops, you know, you have to actually know when they have a drop because it's only for two weeks that you can get something or you have to be an insider and know the people. Um, <laughs> but that's the mixtape. So again, that's the, that's the patina, I call it. That's when the letter pants are getting like really, really cool, you know? You have a really like, and that is really what's missing in many instances. And that's why I don't think Amazon is, is something we shall fear because they are just the, the spot. I mean, I, I like Spotify, okay? So they're not just the Spotify, but they're just Spotify. They don't have the mixtapes. They don't have the vinyl. So that's why, that's really where, you know, we really need to um, basically create, you know, cre you know, understand creativity. So that's why I'm totally with you. Like, move away from very too utilitarian, but really creating emotion. Okay. Philippa, do you want to tell us more about how the, the, the physical and the digital are working together? So how, the, you know, what's happening on the, on the site is, yeah. is using the store of the future and vice versa? Yeah, so what we've seen with online um, and e-commerce is that you get data around what people click, what people basically you know what's their intention, where they clicked, you had all of these, these metrics, um, and now you will be able to get similar metrics uh, within the offline space, which basically gives you the chance to unify everything in one. So one of the things, and this is very specific to to luxury, so what I am saying are features that are interesting for us for Store of the Future would not be features interesting for Amazon Store of the Future. I was recently in San Francisco trying Amazon Go, uh, great experience, um, but it wouldn't work for selling me uh, whatever, Max Mara coats. Uh, so I think it's very different what it means a great experience for, for luxury and this great experience um, in Amazon buying lunch or buying socks, right? So this, this whole part about, we've been talking about omnichannel for 10 years. And we are still trying to get to the story of the future, right? So what I think is happening is in luxury, for example, not everyone wants to be identified. So one of the features that we defined as interesting for our luxury customers, some people want to enter in a shop and they don't want to do uh, a check-in knowing it's that famous person or is that um, VIP. So they want to be anonymous. So one of the features that we presented um, a year ago, maybe a little bit more, is we want customers to have the chance to say that they're anonymous. Another thing we want to give them is if they're already filtered online, if they already created a wish list, again, we want them uh, to have it ready. Um, we want to recommend something that is what they like and not what we know they tried before or they saw before on the website and they passed, right? So all of this and of course the payments, uh, the payment side. So if we already have our information on farfetch.com, why would I need to give my card again uh, in a store? So every single little step that you uh, do with clothes, which is the part of the, the tracking and everything, it's very interesting for us. We want to understand the store like we understand online. Um, and this is, is basically will empower us to be very personalized and inspire better our customer. So you'll, you'll be able to see specific items on the online because you touch something in the store and we know you tried it three times. We actually are not looking so much at, at, at cameras. We are looking at different ways so there's not only um, cameras is not the, the only way to get um, access to these data points uh, and to collect this information. Uh, we had, for example, at Dream Assembly, one of the companies we supported by Buddy, they use tags and they're able to provide uh, all of the information you'd have online in the offline uh, world. Um, these are some, some of the features, uh, but our goal is basically to bring information from offline to online, online to offline, and provide a more personalized and more tailored experience to the customer in the end, and more efficient. Thank you. Joana, do you want to tell us what is the difference between Amazon Go and Sensei? Well, 
Amazon has infinite means, as we were all, all <laughs> yes, saying. That. This is one very big difference. Uh, but actually, so Sensei is empowering the competitors of Amazon, so all other uh, grocery retailers in this case, to have access to the same technology that allows them to uh, like digitize their stores. So I think this is one of the different points. But also, Amazon Go, it's a store concept that Amazon launched. They are the first in the market worldwide. So they launched the first store in Seattle. Now they have about four or five, and they plan to open much more. So when they, when they started it, um, so it was kind of a pilot, a prototype, and a, a store where all the sensors are embedded in the furniture. So it's a, a store built from scratch for this purpose. So as Filippo was saying, there are many other means to capture data, not only cameras, but sensors, weights, many things that you can, you can place in a store. And this is like, um, and this is also different. So when we started Sensei, we were building, we were building the solution to be scalable across existing stores to be able to retrofit existing supermarkets and convenience stores uh, to be able to, so being able to do this using only cameras. And is Sensei um, only appropriate for, for supermarkets or, or could it work for maybe more luxury or fashion products? So I, I totally agree with Philippa and uh, the, the experience that Farfetch wants to give their customers and luxury business. So I think there the most important thing is uh, actually capturing information about the customer to help uh, to, to help the retailer serve the customer better. So it's much more about uh, their interaction with the staff or with the products that matters more than the like being able to check out. So I think this component is not as relevant for retail for uh, for uh, fashion retail or even for uh, luxury. But I believe uh, a technology like this can uh, also provide this kind of information that I think is useful for the purpose. OK. Um, Sabine, do you want to tell us more about what are the potentialities of wearables in general? So what can, what can happen? How can we, what is the science fiction in, in wearables? So um, it's a very broad topic. So I'm going <laughs> to narrow it down to two things. One is sports, uh, and one is the other one is healthcare. Um, and that is because at Supo, that's what we are focusing on, and we also focus on on Gen Z. That's teenagers. Um, teenagers are two billion people on this planet in 2020, so it's quite a few people. So that's basically how I want to narrow it down. Um, but the way I see uh, the future in those two instances, particularly, is that we have the ability to capture through different types of wearables, and that is the Apple Watch, which I wear right now, but then also clothing, and again, sensorized clothing, connected clothing, other types of means like your phone, and so forth, um, to really get data um, and contextualize the data in a way that helps us to um, have a, a democratized healthcare in the future. Basically, have our data with us, have our healthcare data with us. Um, for sports, and again, this is now speaking as a brand, uh, again, one is the consumer and the other one is the brand. So if I speak of the brand, on a brand perspective, um, if I do um, behavior, basically, uh, that's, that's basically wearing behavior. How do I wear a certain piece of garment? Um, how are the sensors that I have in a certain piece of garment um, are actually capturing data sets that are interesting for the manufacturers? Um, those are the two things that are interesting for us in the future for wearables. Um, but wearables in general, I mean, it's literally from the perspective of, and again, this is you know, the work that I've previously been doing quite a bit to really make a sensor completely disappearing and seamless. It basically needs to, needs to get into the actual fabric itself. Uh, and that means we have to change the molecular structure that's chemical processes and physical um, and, uh, and physics. Um, and that is basically really thinking about material science. It has a lot to do with also um, different types of uh, collaborations um, a lot has to do with collaborations from the chemical companies, uh, with material science, um, with uh, technologies, um, microprocessors, and so forth. Um, and that is 
what I see is the future to really make it completely disappearing. And in, of course, the other is that we at Super, we can take any of that data and we can actually contextualize it and make it interesting. And that is really where I, th uh, I see uh, a huge aspect um, of, of where wearables gonna go. Thank you. So before I ask one more question on, about Amazon to, to Nunu, I want to remind you that if you want to ask questions to our speakers, um, you can tweet it and we'll take the questions and, and in a few minutes we'll, you know, we'll get your questions here and hopefully answered by, by our great panel. So Nunu, how do you see um, uh, Amazon moving even more into the fashion world? Are they going to open stores? Um, are they going to be more fashion and less clothing, as I was provoking a little bit earlier on? How do you see it? Yeah, sure, they will have stores, and they will have Amazon Go fashion stores, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have seen what they, they are doing. So and they will apply everything they are doing into the fashion or any other industry. Um, so I think they have a huge potential, huge resource. The most... The biggest resource that Amazon have is the the knowledge that they have from these database that they have on customers already. So they know everything about us. So how do we, what kind of products we we like to buy, and what we wear, and how many times we buy. Uh, so that's key for developing a product, a services, or a business model. So it will be very interesting to see how they will do it, and sure they will go into fashion from clothing from socks to fashion, and we have seen what, what they are preparing with uh, artificial intelligence, so creating and designing, putting a computer, changing a, the designer, uh, uh, doing a, a dress or something like that. So uh, I think that they will try to push boundaries to do something like innovating on this field too. Very. So do you think even designers are going to disappear? I don't, I don't see the they will disappear, but they will try to push that on that way. And something like uh, merging artificial intelligence with a human designer for the first step. And then we'll have like uh, some designers doing something and machines doing the other thing. So it will be very interesting to see what, what will happen. So I'm just speculating, I don't know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so because we're talking about the future and because we're, we're a school, I would like each one of you to give an advice to some student who wants to work in that area? What do you, what advice would you give them? How can they make a career in the future of fashion and retail? So I don't know who wants to start. Um, so I started in fashion tech basically um, with just an idea. So I, I had a, a startup named Chic by Choice. Um, I was very resilient, which I think it's very important. I was very eager to learn about the topic. And I didn't, uh, I wasn't afraid of asking for help to random people. So I remember asking you, can you introduce me to uh, this very famous person um, that is, for example, she owns Gucci and she owns um, many other things in many other businesses in Portugal. And what we did with, was we just randomly sent, like we sent a very well thought out email but to someone that didn't know anything about us, didn't know anything about um, fashion rentals. So really try to see who is in, the, in your industry, in the industry you love, that you admire, that you can seek advice. Don't be afraid. Uh, I was 20 years old at the time, and um, it's great, and you will see how many people will be open to meeting you just because they want to spend some time with you, talking about your idea, um, yeah, I would say this is... So don't be afraid, don't and, be afraid. Ask, uh, and ask for advice. Okay, totally review myself and what Philippe said. You, you really must be resilient if you want to start something from scratch, especially if you want to do something that also Amazon is doing. So you must be a bit crazy as well. But actually, so I think that when you... you you are starting you will and you want to build something that can become a global business you need investors and i think investors play a very important role so for example in our case for for sensei so i, I was very uh, familiar familiar with uh, uh, fashion retail actually and now i end up working on grocery and uh, mass consumer retail 
So I had no experience in this type of uh, business and in this type of retail. So we ended up uh, founding our first investors into uh, large retailers. So a, a German company called Metro, uh, they are like the 16th biggest retailer in the world. And they are actually eager to innovate and to invest is, in small startups. So uh, we also had the, the trust of uh, Sonai Investment Management in Portugal to support us from our, in uh, our first round of investment. And I think having these players um, with us um, has played an important role because we can have kind of an unfair advantage towards other players that work in these markets because you, you can have, get actually access to how the business works much earlier on. So you can actually um, like find your, what you call the product market fit much easier because you have your partners uh, like actually pushing you to it. So in the discussions you have with them, you find out what really is important for them, what are really their needs. And I see this helps you actually move much, much faster and create something that otherwise would be much tougher to figure out what would be a, a good solution to offer to a retailer in our case. So one of, of the things that it's kind of comes back to the like beginning is I think both of us have the families that have a background in, in retail. So either retail or technology or retail. So the seed is was there since since early on probably and also that had a an impact so this is just one of, of the things is to take advantage of your family a, uh, links. Not, not i remember not taking advantage necessarily of the context but learning about tech because my dad was working in retail tech providing technology for boutiques and brands uh in your case i'm sure it was also impactful no that you had that uh, retail side in your family. Yes, sure. I, yes, I, t I totally agree. Yes, so like I think since I was born, like I was in the middle of stores and retail. Mm -hmm. So this was always there. So I, I thought that maybe if I had some um, opportunity to make something better in retail, I would do it. So I, of course, I had to convince a few other co-founders to join this because we are working in something which is uh, deep technology and for that you really need to have a very strong tech team so you need expertise on the market but also expertise on tech to build something like that so i think that's very important as well we are in a business school so i think if you want to start a business in like deep technology or artificial intelligence or something like that you must found like uh, people who are also passionate and, and knowledgeable about that areas because that, that's going to also mm -hmm. be, be key for sure uh, we have we had we got questions from the audience, so you know I'm going to give you the question. You can answer either mine, my original question, which is what is the advice for students. But here the question is what is the advice for small brands or for entrepreneurs in this area? So you know I think we're in a way just broadening the question. So what what advice do you give to entrepreneurs or or or, or small brands who want to have some presence in this in this area? So Nunu Sabine. So. And the first of all is uh, to look at the marketplaces that already exist instead of creating a store from scratch mm -hmm. and to understand the consumer, to understand what they want, to analyze the data. And then after, you can escalate and try to have your own store online and offline. So it's a, the digital offers a new opportunity to, to touch the market and to see what they really want from your product and get the insights from the market directly and then try to escalate so that's one one of the things that i think digital can you can do a lot with less effort and less investment start small yeah much more sabine well learn learn what a curly bracket is um what that basically means is if you are experienced in in business and in fashion uh, you definitely need to learn uh, a code like learn one programming language or one like really dig deep into or not deep but like at least get your hands dirty 
Uh, don't be scared. Uh, you can program a lily pad in pretty much an hour and make an LED blink. So that's physical computing. You can, you know, write uh, some line of code to actually, you know, get some data from Google Analytics. It's really easy. Uh, so it's it's one of those things that's very important if you want to deal with technology, whether that is using data for retail. Uh, or using data, in my instance, for literally wearable technology, um, that is very, very, very important. Because otherwise, you really literally going to get screwed. Uh, because people are going to overcharge you. You will not find the right team members. I think beginning, you know, you said resilience as an entrepreneur, I think super important. Uh, you said investors as an, as an entrepreneur or startup, super important. I actually also want to confer here to the team. Like the people that are actually starting a company with you, uh, they need to be super, super experienced in what they do in terms of working with you in their particular areas. You need to give them space. You need to be able to actually really have them grow within the company. They need to be the DNA of your company. So that's basically a very, very important aspect because you can't do it alone. Um, and the more you know about your space, and again, I defer to the two of you, like also um, how you really get to know uh, your space. In your instance, you know, you were lucky your families were in that space. I mean, I was lucky because my dad taught me programming. I've been programming since I've been 12. So, um, you know, that's basically, use that as an advantage. It's your USB. I mean, you're in business school, so it's your USB. So I'm going to try to summarize it because it's, uh, it's almost 8 o'clock. So it seems that the future of fashion and retail um, is going to use some technology, different technologies, but not only technologies. Thank God there will still be people. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities. So I want to thank you all very, very, very much. It was very, very interesting. I really enjoyed the different perspective that you brought. And thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs>